Znači, Franka imamo uglavnom zonu publiku, ne između sebe. Should we get started? I think so, yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, next event in the um, series of events that the East Central European Center has organized this semester. Uh, tonight, our event is sponsored both by the East Central European Center and the Njegoš Endowment for Serbian Language and Culture, um, housed here in the Harriman Institute. And uh, the topic of our event is a wonderful new translation of um, an incredibly uh, seminal as well as controversial book that came out uh, in Serbia in the late 1960s and has recently been translated. Uh, the book, The Philosophy of Parochialism, which I'll leave it to my co-director to introduce. Uh, my name is Christopher Case. I'm the co-director of the East Central European Center. Uh, I'll introduce our panelists that we have tonight and then turn it over to my co-director, Alexander uh, Boskovic, who will say a little bit about the, uh, the literary, philosophical, um, and um, national context uh, in which the, the book that we'll, we're discussing tonight is embedded. Uh, so in any case, our first uh, panelist tonight is Branislav Jakobjevic, uh, who has joined us from California, where he is a professor and the department chair at the Theater and Performance Studies uh, Department. Uh, he's the author of a monograph entitled Alienation Effects, Performance and Self-Management in Yugoslavia, 1945 to 1991, published with the University of Michigan Press in 2016, which has won numerous awards. Uh, he is um, a widely published uh, author and critic, uh, publishing both in Serbian and in English on topics ranging from the history of modernist theater to experimental performance, to avant-garde and conceptual art, contemporary performance, he publishes in leading scholarly journals in the US, such as Theater Journal, uh, Art Journal, Art Margins, and Theater. Uh, and in 2019, I'm sorry, 2013, he chaired the 19th Annual Performance Studies International Conference, now then, Performance and Temporality at Stanford University. Uh, so we're very happy to have with us tonight, Branislav Ekogevich, who is also the uh, translator, uh, co-translator of the text, which we are discussing tonight, uh, and will provide a, um, uh, a uh, uh, incisive insight on that process and product. Um, our second panelist tonight uh, is our own Columbia University's uh, Branka Asic, who is the Charles and Lynn Jean Professor of English and Comparative Literature here. Uh, she specializes in 19th century, uh, in the 19th century Americas in their scientific, philosophical, and religious contexts. Uh, she's the author of several books, most recently Bird Relics, Reef and Vitalism in Thoreau, published at Harvard University Press, also in 2016. Uh, both of you were very prolific in 2016, <laughs> it appears. Um, and it also was awarded uh, multiple prizes, including the MLA James Russell Lowell Prize for Outstanding Book of 2016. She publishes in journals such as Common Knowledge, Diacritics, um, uh, English Literary History, Leviathan, New England Quarterly, uh, Representations, Sexual Practice, and she discusses authors in her work such as uh, Mary Robinson, Ann Bradstreet, Jonathan Edwards, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emily Dickinson, Herman Melville, many other um, uh, important American literary figures of the 19th century. Um, and uh, I'll now turn it over to my co-director, Alexander Boskovic, who is the uh, lecturer in Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian studies uh, here at Columbia University. He'll say a little bit about the author of the translated book, which we are discussing tonight. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, thank you, Branislav and, and Branka, for, for joining us today. Now, I think this is a great um, um, <clears throat> great opportunity to say a few words about Radomir Konstantinović, who is a Serbian writer, philosopher, public intellectual, and um, a person who wrote most of his uh, books in the second half of the 20th century. He was a very prolific writer. Um, in, when he was in his 20s, he published two books that engage with poetry. Uh, one is the um, critical study of the Serbian poet from 19th century, Jura Jakšić, and the other is his own uh, poetry collection that remained his sole book of poetry. And um, 
he was from very early age interested in exploring uh, poetic language and he continued this exploration uh, to his prose works because he published a lot of novels during the 50s and 60s, uh, such as Give Us Today, The Mousetrap, um, and uh, Exodus, which, for which he won uh, the most prestigious uh, Nin Award. Uh, for the best Yugoslav novel of the year in the 1960s. Uh, and he at the same time published a lot of critical essays. Um, and in 1964, um, publication of his book, uh, uh, Hasferus, or the treatise about a beer bottle, marked departure from fiction towards narrative essay. Uh, in the 1966, he published a book of essays, Pentagram. Uh, and at the time, in the 1960s, it's very important to mention that the main, uh, the editor-in-chief of Radio Belgrade's third program uh, asked Konstantinovich to put together a compendium of uh, Serbian poets, poets from the first uh, uh, decades of the 20th century. Um, and from this project actually grew the book that we're going to talk about today, The Philosophy of Parochialism, that was published in 1969. Uh, and after this time, uh, Konstantinovich continued broad broadcasting on the third program of Belgrade Radio. Um, uh, his um, uh, essays on individual poets, and he worked on this project for more than a decade. And the results was his capital work, uh, comprising essays on more than 100 Serbian poets uh, that was published in 1983 in the eighth volume uh, book called Being and Language in the Experience of the Poets in Serbian 20th Century Culture. Um, and the last book that Konstantinovich published were, uh, one was his literary masterpiece and the swan song, the novel called uh, Death, Death of Descartes, uh, the excerpts of which have been translated in English by Vladislav Veronia and published in the online platform of Brooklyn Rail called In Translation. Um, and the companion piece to his li uh, late literary work, Beckett, the Friend, from 2000, which is a collection of letters that Samuel Beckett sent to Konstantinovich. And tonight we are very pleased to have today with us two scholars who, who are experts on Konstantinovich's work. I would just say that Branka Arsic edited a collection of essays on Konstantinovich's death of Beckett uh, in, in the late 90s. Um, and Branis Lovjakovic, of course, edited and translated the book that we're going to talk about uh, today, which is the most famous book by Konstantinovich, The Philosophy of, of uh, Parochialism, that was published by University of Michigan Pr Press in uh, 2021, last year. And I just want to say for all of you who are uh, looking at us online and who are interested in purchasing the book, you can do this through the University of Michigan Press website. Uh, there is also on our own uh, link for this event, um, a link to the, that website and also the discount code uh, that you can uh, use for 30% off uh, um, for, for this uh, edition. Uh, and the philosophy of parochialism, uh, I would just add that is one of the books that is both hated and admired. It is the book that was severely attacked but at the same time, it represented an example of a courage uh, to writers and intellectuals uh, in, the, in the region of former Yugoslavia. Um, and I hope today uh, that today's discussion will help us answer the question that Rani Stoljakovic is asking and starts his introduction in this book, namely why to read this book uh, today. What does this book have to offer the readers? Uh, outside of its cultural and historical uh, setting of Southeastern Europe, Balkans, Serbia, and, and uh, former Yugoslavia. Um, so that said, I would just like to uh, maybe start this conversation if you um, would like to tell us a little bit about the concept in the title of this book, the concept of Palanka um, that has been translated uh, in different ways and tell us a little bit about why did you choose to, uh, par to use parochialism in the title instead of maybe province uh, and why, why that choice was yeah. made. Yeah. Okay. First of all, thank you, uh, Sasha, so much. Thank you for organizing this event. It's uh, strange to speak to, you know, the basically the camera and, and uh, a very good friend. Um, 
and I'm, I'm really honored to be here with, with uh, uh, Branka, who, who is uh, really one of the, the most uh, um, penetrating readers of, of Konstantinovich. So I'll, I'll start with a very simple answer. It was Branka who convinced me that it should be parochialism, <laughs> and I thank you for that. Branka. Because the, the the original title is really difficult to translate. This was a difficult book to translate to begin with. And the difficulties start with the title. Um, the, the, origin, the title in the original is Philosophia Palanque. So both words were very intentionally chosen by Konstantinovich and Palanque is a particularly challenging uh, a word. Um, it translates most directly as province, but it's not really a direct translation. That translation is also very much a mistranslation because Palanca has its unique properties and um, historical, etymological, and so on. And I will just say a couple of words about etymology and turn it to Branka to tell us about parochialism. So Palanka comes from uh, the, um, as far as I could tell, it entered Serbian from Hungarian um, and it's, it came from to Hungarian from French. Uh, it has Latin root of planka, piece of wood, um, uh, a stud, uh, it designates uh, a certain kind of fortified uh, uh, settlement with uh, wooden palisades. So there is a strong sense of, of fortification, of closeness, of insulation, which were the basic properties of this kind of um, really uh, a social unit that that uh, Konstantinovich takes as his starting point. So the idea is of enclosure, insularity, certain kind of uh, sense of being besieged from the outside. Uh, so that's on one hand. On the other hand, um, uh, province also has its place in the history of, of colonialism and has been used recently in post-colonial studies to designate a certain kind of really uh, dynamic between the metropole and the overseas colony. And that kind of really emancipatory turn of the term province simply doesn't work with Palanca. It doesn't have that kind of dynamic. So when, I, uh, when we talked a number of years back and that, Branka asked me, okay, so how are you translating the title? When I told her, she was like, no, 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 you can't do that. And she convinced me that it should be something else. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Branka, and tell us about your reading. Uh, of reading of the same, well, yeah. let me just also first thank, thank you guys for uh, having us and introducing us and the, above all for the attention to um, Konstantinovich's work. Um, uh, I pretty much uh, can only uh, sum up and repeat what, what you already said, um, less of going into like serious uh, engagement with the basic philosophical premise, premise of, of the book. If there is one premise of the book, mm -hmm. which is also kind of questionable. But I uh, can only say that um, uh, 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 provinces are have geographical determination. Uh, parochialism is a state of mind. Yeah. Um, and uh, that is what Konstantinovich uh, his book is about, a, a state of mind and not about where people live or where they were born. Uh, so after his logic, somebody born in the so-called metropolitan uh, sites of the global <laughs> uh, world, such as Paris, New York, um, Hong Kong, and I don't know, you, you name it, um, are not by 
by any means protected from uh, being very parochial. Um, and, and oppositely, people who live on um, so-called alleged, uh, in, in alleged provinces, uh, such as, for instance, I don't know, Inch, <laughs> um, uh, are by no means parochial. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that that um, that, that was uh, uh, the, the major kind of uh, uh, contribution of constitutive philosophy, uh, philosophy to philosophy to kind of zoom into this kind of mindset that in order to differentiate. Uh, um, um, between different types of, of minds and consciousnesses um, and to establish this idea of a parochial mind, uh, but without attaching it to anything kind of specifically uh, determined specifically in any um, uh, geographical or sociological um, uh, register. This is a, um, a way of being. Um, or a way of thinking um, that can befall equally uh, those who are um, in metropolitan centers and those who are on, uh, on their margins. And I think that one of the reasons that this book was not immediately, I mean, other than the fact that it's very difficult to read, but I mean, that it was not uh, immediately kind of um, 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 accepted or was immediately critiqued then pretty much from all sides, um, from the kind of, you know, praxis group and from um, the, um, the Marxists and non-Marxists and, you know, the traditionalists. That is because for their own reasons, everybody was thinking like, oh, you cannot say anything against uh, provinces, um, that is to say a small town people, because that's the labor, where the labor is, and then, you know, so that misreading the book just at the level of kind of misunderstanding the, the concept of parochialism as referring to small town, um, some people understood that, um, that uh, Rade was here after people from small town, which um, it, if that were the case, uh, <laughs> it would be really ridiculous. Um, and, and so it isn't the case. But for whatever reason, it is, however much we, we uh, repeat this thing, uh, it's for whatever reason really difficult to reach um, people. And even today, um, you, uh, people who even today study uh, uh, Radis philosophy in, um, in, in the region, as now Yugoslavia is called this region, <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, they, they still uh, spend a lot of time struggling with that and, and explaining that. There's no way that this is written against people who um, are uh, who, who live on the market. It it's actually written in support of people who are marginalized um, and who really do not think um, along the lines of the kind of mainstream um, and are not in conformity. Um, and maybe even way of, of thinking about the parochial mind would be uh, to say that that's the mind that's in conformity with the majority or, or, or so. He, he says on page one, anticipating these kinds of responses. So second paragraph. Uh, there is no world out of the parochial spirit. Only that spirit professing the, re re the religion of closeness, a religion wherein the supreme God is this God of unity, whose antithetical demonic power is the evil of absolute openness, knows this absolutely open world. Is it not true then that if the world is parochial, the province, the province must be equally worldly. So what he's talking about, the, one of the ways that we can read that kind of relationship is through the dynamic of the, the province and the empire. And it's, that is something that where, that is one area where this book, once it exits its own language and its original culture can make really new contributions. So what I found especially interesting is actually the 
on the one hand, he's talking about the state of mind, he's talking about the spirit and all of these things. But his case studies are very specific case studies from the history of Serbian literature, modernist literature from late mid to late 19th century to mid 20th century. So it's a very specific historical period. And he's and also very specific cultural and uh, and and uh, geographic really uh, uh, region. And uh, basically, what we are looking at there is a specific kind of the dynamic between the world and the province, between the empire and and province, which Hannah Arendt describes as continental imperialism. So whereas overseas imperialism establishes overseas the detached provinces and colonies, the specificity of continental imperialism is to establish its provinces in its colonies within. So they are engulfed by the empire and they actively participate in the empire. They are not detached and they become a major phenomenon of imperial thinking. So you can read the empire, that state of mind, the imperial state of, state of mind through this kind of parochial mindset. And that may be one of the major things that this book can bring to discussion of things that are happening with contemporary manifestations of imperial ideas. Thank you so much. I think this is uh, this is already tapping onto the area where the question was yeah. asked: yeah. how we can read this outside yeah. of the uh, region of Southeast Europe or former Yugoslavia? Um, okay, um, so I just want to maybe ask you something for the broader audience: uh, what is this book in terms of its genre? Is this a philosophy? Is this anthropological essay? A literary study? Or how, how, how would you describe it to, to general audience, um, the scope of the book, as its style is, as you said, very complicated and difficult to translate, I think that the, its genre um, classification is also hard to, to designate. I, I think it really, when you look at the book itself, the way it is composed, the way it is structured, even if in its form, it actively defies and resists this idea of closeness, closeness, limitation, being fencing, fenced in within even a certain kind of genre. Mm -hmm. So it actively transcends and resists this kind of genre classifications. And I think that's a very intentional move. Um, don't we should not forget that we're talking about a poet and a novelist and a creative writer before essays. So I like your your um, phrase narrative essay, but it's more than that. And I'll just give one example and then turn it over to, to Branka. So the book uh, has three distinct parts. The first part consists of two dozen small chapters, which are basically Montaigne-like reflections on different uh, aspects of parochialism. Then the second part of roughly equal length consists of 13 endnotes, each one being a chapter long unit, which is added to their endnotes, right? Only each one is chapter long. And then to that, to those endnotes, there are appended footnotes. And you can imagine that going on and on and on, and defying the very boundaries of the book, which he actually did in being and language, continuing kind of reflection. Another detail which is quite telling is that the first part begins, the first chapter is in rule of an introduction and the end is in rule of a conclusion. So 
both boundary signs of a book are provisional, right? There is no beginning, no end, right? And this, it defies this kind of insularity and closeness of parochial notes. And exactly, and the reason for that, I think, is also inherent in the very idea of what parochialism is, or what kind of a mind a parochial mind is. And I think that Raja would always say that those people who know uh, what the beginning is, <laughs> or those people <laughs> who kind of ever reach a conclusion, you know, and get firm or, or, or anything. That, that's, you know, another way to think about walling oneself into something. And uh, so this is the book that formally, that is to say, by its intentional formlessness, as it were, um, also wants to kind of, and going into different genre and the different practices of writing and different ways of thinking, really endeavors to kind of practice the kind of anti-parochial kind of state of, state of mind. Um, you know, people always ask, is it philosophy? Is it itself literature? Is it about mm -hmm. philosophy? Is it about literature? It's all, all of that. Um, it really proliferates as um, um, some of my, um, um, uh, some of the parts that I cherish the most are in fact long kind of footnotes and notes, um, it, as opposed to kind of like main pieces of uh, the arguments. Then the second book that it goes in kind of these smaller chapters that are kind of some of them even occasional pieces. Um, also cherish, also kind of um, has some of the most famous um, examples of um, um, you know the um, rather the idea of the, um, um, the parochial spirit. And I would I just wanted to kind of maybe uh, get closer to the very the very idea of it <laughs> is it to kind of point to two uh, briefly two um, um, chapters and then to two footnotes. Um, these two chapters, in, in fact, they're notes chapters, <laughs> the, the kind of chapters that are towards the end of the book. Um, they are they're kind of follow one another. One is called Spirit Nation Against the Spirit. Um, the premise of this being that, you know, these people would think through or on a basis or grounded in the spirit of their nation, culture, or identity, who are grounded in their collective identities, um, come very close to what Radha has to say about parochial minds. Um, and, then, and then he being who he was, uh, that is to say not parochial, um, he follows that, uh, that um, um, cha chapter note by the very famous 13 note chapter called Serbian Nazism in which he um, um, uses, mobilizes the very Nazism rather than nationalism, which really was an unusual and pretty radical kind of thing to do um, then and now um, to identify a tradition of thinking in kind of a um, Serbian, uh, actually poetic history of, of, of the lyric um, as kind of, uh, being um, in conversation and supportive, sometimes even without knowing that they were doing that, like the ideology of Nazism. Um, so his idea, therefore, being, okay, one has to clean, as it were, first in front of one's own door. Mm -hmm. um, and one first has to, uh, you know, take care about the things that are, that are wrong, with one's own identity, and there are always plenty of those that, you know, everybody's identity. Now, what became interesting that it is the following thing, and, and I remember having a conversation um, about this, the Radek, who actually started it, and who said that, you know, he was very, very pleased that during the most recent Balkan Wars, um, there was an increased uh, interest in, in the book. Um, and then very many people asked um, for, you know, chunks of the book to be translated into different languages. But it's systematically, uh, the chapter that people wanted to translate was this 13th chapter, yes. Serbian Nazism, as if the book was. About. Um, about and as if that 
that palanka as if the parochial mind was ser somehow Serbian per se. And then, of course, that didn't sit well with, you know, all kinds of people in Serbia and so on and so forth. So he was aware of the fact that, you know, he would always give it to people. So, of course, go and translate whatever you want. Um, but he did, 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 that did not go unnoticed by him that those who solicited translation, um, in that particular moment focused on that particular thing instead of other uh, chapters that would in fact prove maybe or be better introduction to his concept of uh, parochialism and 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 so just kind of browsing through this and i wanted to say i i, I we really have to make time for that something about the term translation itself yeah. Um, but just to kind of, uh, I reminded, I was reminded of these two fabulous um, notes, footnotes, uh, and, um, and, and how different, in fact, what they're saying about what parochial mind is. So one is on page 205, it's footnote five, about a tradition of Serbian romanticism, um, like a very crucial tradition for, I mean, romanticism for all European uh, Literature is obviously a crucial moment, but so so it was for Serbian literature. And um, and Konstantinovich goes with Medias Res and says the whole Serbian Romanticism, especially in its final period, exudes the fear of a man outside the clan. It is it is nationalistic. So he goes on to offer very very sophisticated analysis and in fact his eight volume or nine volume book being in language is about you know um, uh, Serbian romanticism so this is not unfounded as it were you know ad hoc sentence but it does say something disturbing the whole of Serbian romanticism <laughs> is there is there maybe an exception uh, no so you, you read this and you think okay he really is like um, you know, going deep into the tradition of Serbian thinking, of Serbian um, of Serbian poetry. Poetry specifically interests him more than the other uh, um, uh, literary forms. Um, and so, of course, um, and so, of course, uh, pro-nationalist um, literary critics, uh, writers, or, you know, and, and not to mention nationalists, but there's so many of them, um, were very, very quick on, you know, saying, oh, this is a proof that, and, and sentences like, like these, and these kind of evaluations of, of Serbian tra literary tradition and proof that the Constitution which is in fact totally anti-Serbian. But then you go on page 177, and then he is now addressing a very different tradition to which he was closer intellectually, nevertheless, not completely close not close enough to pass by the, by it without critiquing it and that is a tradition of urban kind of um, um, way of thinking uh, um, in the 20th century uh, serbian literature um, especially um, a, a tradition that was inaugurated by vinaver and vladimir Jankovic. and so he says the following thing he quotes now this guy from a very different tradition, Vladimir Velmar um, in his 1938 book, I, for, I, I even forgot that this book uh, exists in a cool title, A View from Kalamagdan, A Study of a Belgrade There, a, a Study of a Belgrade There, a, a person from Belgrade, um, in which this, this um, uh, author says, a person from a Belgrade There of all times and also of the new ones, heartily laments a unified Serbia. And the rabbi goes on to say, after this, it says, well, you know, these guys from Belgrade, these so-called urban guys who lament the unification of Serbia. Well, there you go. That's another example of a parochial spirit. Why is that parochial? Well, because it's so Belgrade-centered. So if you read this book, it really goes after this kind of two major kind of traditions, one, one so-called cosmopolitan that he actually discerns as very parochial and the other one anti-cosmopolitan um that that uh, that presents itself as as national that he discerns as not even national but nazi and so you know that is why uh, it's so difficult for this book to kind of make its way to um i'm not sure i cannot say i, I i'm not going 
I'm, I'm not there often. I'm in fact never. But so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but, but but you know whether whether people now teach it maybe at the university or, um, well you know so the the spirit of parochialism. Completely triumphant. Yes. Completely. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's important to clarify one thing, and that's so so interesting. So he takes one particular national uh, national or literature right literary uh, national literary history mm -hmm. and he makes a major philosophical and a series of political claims as we have heard through readings of lyrical poetry mm -hmm. so the question is what is the relationship between ly lyrical poetry and politics what is the relationship between lyrical poetry and ideology? Isn't lyrical poetry supposed, unlike epic, right, mm -hmm. to escape, transcend, uh, somehow spill out, uh, uh, transgress these kinds of uh, state, political, ideological structures, right? And what is very much at the center of the book is why, why is uh, Serbia, Serbian literary history is such an interesting case. After an emancipation of Serbia from Ottoman Empire, it pretty much starts from this from scratch. So we have basically simultaneous building of the state and of modern modern state and modern literature. And he reads as much critics as he reads the poets. Mm -hmm. And one of his a really most penetrating uh, uh, observations come from reading of one of the leading uh, literary critics from the turn of the 20th century called Jovan Popovic. They were all very much influenced by French literary criticism and all of that. And Jovan Popovic, Bogdan, Bogdan Popovic, uh, sorry, um, argues that basically a poem should be like the state. The poem should be whole and complete. The poem does not beautiful. end beautiful. It cannot have inconsistencies. It has to rhyme. It has to be whole and rounded up and complete. Uh, it has to has its symmetry. It has to has its harmony. So the state is like the poem and poem is like the state and in that kind of call or what um, Bogdan Popovich called whole complete poem you have uh, ideology of the state in a nutshell and it goes down to the line so the state from the state we go to the point and each line has to be balanced harmonious and all of that and it has to have its closure, right? Clear beginning, middle, and all of that. So you have parochial mindset restated in each point, and the state announces itself through each point, right? So right there, there is the whole the really universe that closes upon itself and does not want to admit any kind of openness, any kind of disharmony, any kind of failure to accomplish that closure, right? All complete part. That is very interesting. Thank you so much for bringing that uh, up. Um, if I can just like uh, ask question regarding to that, do you, do you think there is uh, someone else in history of Western philosophy who who is close to Konstantinovich uh, engaging with this question in relation between the poetry and the ideology of the state. Uh, and if you if you can go in that direction, if that sounds interesting to you. It sounds very interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, the call, there, there was alarmingly little uh, really reflection on the relationship of lyrical poetry and politics. Um, I, I really admire Brecht, but he's kind of at fault with that too, you know, with his 
uh, insistent somatic form and all of that. But Adorno was one of uh, actually Konstantinovich's contemporaries mm -hmm. who at the very same time, which is also interesting, in the second half of the 1960s wrote about these things. Uh, in negative dialectics, the, the jargon of authenticity, and then in some essays. And um, he, I'm afraid, goes a different route. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Branka, have you looked? Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, would, I would say that uh, if you're saying that lyrical poetry, uh, um, then, then my sense is uh, closer to uh, you, you know the stuff I'm reading recently. Uh, that there is a kind of a really um, distinct tendency in literary scholarship to sell, as it were, um, or at, at, at all costs, to, uh, tell us that some really disturbing moments in, uh, say, British Romanticism um, or German Romanticism was in fact something really very progressive uh, and that you know the romantic call for unity was in fact some you know, it was the unity of you know the difference and uh, and so so obviously one can do that that way um, but I think that um, as interesting as this move is to kind of do not address the because Serbian romantic Serbian lyric poetry is not unique in this by by any means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that just has to be said, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, you can go to this kind of giants, so people like Hoderlin, um, and say, okay, you know, there's really two ways of reading what he's saying. You know, <laughs> oh, we abandon, you know, and the gods are not here, and this is a decline and you know everything's gone and Europe is no more and Europe has to recover and the world is gone and so this is what on a smaller more provincial level <laughs> you know the Serbs are saying you know like they don't know our they don't read Aristotle and ancient Greek is uh, less perfect um, but it's the same gesture right so we don't have to focus on you know um Rather did because that was his topic. But I mean, it, it was by no means unique to you know Serbian or, or Croatian yeah. romanticism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, and so the, you know there is this kind of effort. It seems to me to kind of read it as if you know you know Holden said that, but this in fact this is what he meant. He didn't mean what there was no. There's, there's an effort to kind of safeguard, as it were, um, the. the the extremely important event of European Romanticism, extremely important for you know European philosophy, uh, safeguarded from these kind of other possible kind of interpretations um, that it's also susceptible to. Yeah, yeah. I think you know um, Adorno and Konstantinovich go hand in hand part of the way. And then at one point, Konstantinovich departs in a radically different direction. I don't know if he had a chance. I mean, they were writing at the same time. So basically, what is, how far did they go and where do they start? So what both of them argue at that time is that basically, we, another thing that needs to be really clear is that um, the, the initial moment, the trigger for Konstantinovich is in working on this book, as far as I can tell, is that he's writing in response to two major imperial projects in Europe of the early 20th century. The first one is fascism, the second one is Stalinism. Uh, when he gave one interview about this book, uh, two years after it was published, he was asked, okay, so tell us what is, uh, it was in a student newspaper, I did, he did. And he's, what is the book about, or you know, how should we approach it? And he said, if you want to understand uh, the philosophy of par parochialism, go read Akasferos, which is the book about basically the Holocaust in, in uh, Serbia. So he's responding to that. Um, 
uh, Adorno is likewise responding to German Nazism, right? And both are saying basically that Nazism is not the product unlike what Wilhelm Reich or Marcuse would say, it's not the product of irrationality. It's not the, the fireworks or triumph of irrationality. Quite to, to the opposite. It is the triumph, the parochialism is the phenomenon of bourgeois rationality and of what he calls a certain kind of primitive positivism. It is that kind of positivism, that kind of rationalism that takes parochial, that constitutes parochial mind. It doesn't want to open itself to other things, other ways of thinking. Where I'm simplifying, where Adorno sees a kind of way out, the what we could call deprovincialization is through supreme works of European modernism. Schoenberg, Beckett, uh, poets of German expressionism and like that. So it is really, um, he's searching for that way out of this closed mindedness of parochialism through high art. Mm -hmm. Konstantinovich says, no, 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 that's parochialism in its prime. And he's looking really for the lowest possible. He says basically that the most parochial gesture is the rejection, violent rejection of the prophets. You have to understand it, to borrow through it, and to find your way out. And he finds poets, that was what people found that annoying initially. He was elevating poets that no one heard about. Dusan Sredojevic, who died like in a um, madhouse, uh, having published one collection of poems, or this who was a notorious alcoholic who couldn't move for a week. I mean, he was constantly hung over. He, he spent more time uh, catching his, what do they call it, flask, <laughs> <laughs> please, then writing poems, right? He says his laziness is an intervention against his own provincialism. Provincialism, parochialism doesn't belong to the other. You don't project it on the other. It is always your own, right? And this is something what Franca said about uh, privileging the marginalized, the outcasts, yeah, and so yeah. forth. Yeah, yeah. So there is a, you know, on one hand, he's also to a certain degree like Adorno. Um, you know, it's part of that time, this high modernist European individualism, right? Um, a single person has to engage with these forces. But then when you read the book, there is a whole collective of these outcasts, of these people who cannot stand any kind of community, he brings them together. And he says, look, each of them, and I'm quoting, in their own way, found their own way outside of the, outside of the province. I would like to go back to that, but we have a question from the audience that I will read, and it goes uh, it goes back to the comment that has been already made. Uh, so Samedin Rogchanin is asking, I did my BA in English language long time ago at Belgrade University. At the time, Kostatinovich's book was rendered almost impossible to translate, even by our very experienced professors, mostly due to, to the stylistic reasons. And curious to know more about the translation process. How long did it take? What were some of the most challenging parts, etc.? It was very, very difficult. <laughs> very. Um, so it took us off and on 10 years. Um, so well, the process went as such. So th this is a very, as Frank already mentioned, difficult prose, philosophical prose. Um, and and um, it's really really challenging. He's he's uh, a Hegelian in his spirit. Really, he's not never quoting Hegel, but he's reading Hegel. You can see that 
uh, his sentence is half a page long. You forget where he began by the time you get to the. It's it is a challenging thing. So we what we did um, to respond directly was to first um, uh, I I applied for a grant, received a grant, and hired a professional translator, uh, Liliana Nikolic, who is excellent in translating from Serbian into English. Um, she does not specialize in philosophy, but has a broad range of, of uh, literary, historical, critical works that she translated. Uh, she did the first draft, and then I did maybe the next three or four drafts. Sometimes in order to unpack one sentence, I would go and read a whole chapter from being in language. Um, and that was basically a very slow, painstaking procedure. And translation is not only transposing um, a text from one uh, language to another, it's a transposition of a text from one culture to another. Right. So there are so many references that are implied in certain statements. So uh, to his structure of notes and footnotes, we had to add another, I had to add another layer of notes that would explain all of these things, uh, often going to uh, a being and language. So it was quite, quite a process. And the challenge again, right at the get go. Uh, parochialism, and I want to don't want even to mention his his archaic use of the word uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's not philosophia; it's philosophia. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. So uh, there are many these kind of minute things throughout. It. Thank you. Yeah, and, and while we are there, and you mentioned how com how difficult it is to put this book within the. Uh, within the framework of existing genre, what would be just briefly maybe your advice to an English reader who is facing for the first time culture that is ar arcane, yeah. <laughs> to put it that way? Okay. Um, you know, how to read, right? Yeah. How to map. I, I don't know how many times I've read this book mm -hmm. in, in Serbian and in English. Um, I started reading it in high school and, you yeah. know, it's a process. And every time I read it, I would read it like you read the book from cover to cover, from you know, first page to the last page. And only in the final phase of translating the book, when I would leave the translation on the side and go back to it, I realized, okay, if I was a non-Serbian reader, probably it would be a good idea to read it as it was meant. So you read the chapter and you go to the note, which refers to that chapter, and then go back to the main text. So go between the notes. I think that's probably for a non-native reader. Branka, what do you think? You know, I mean, I used to be a native reader and they, um, <laughs> they, they, the, the nice first tried to read it as an undergraduate, I couldn't really go through these first several um, chapters. So mm -hmm. I started from notes. You started. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then I kept, re I, I mean, I kept rereading them and it's kind of through that kind of, they kind of explain the, yeah. the, the language gets progressively less and less abstract. Yeah. Um, and especially I think that's especially true about the notes that also have lots of examples and are often even not only sarcastic, but very funny. And um, yeah. so, um, uh, you know, if, if people experience difficulties, I, I mean, you know, I just want to add to this, well, the sentences are long, but look, Serbian, like French, tolerates long language, uh, long sentences. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't read, doesn't sound as terrible in, in Serbian yeah, as in English yeah, to yeah, kind of, yeah, you know, yeah. have a several pages long sentence. <laughs> so did, uh, what did you do? Did you, did you kind of divide them and cut them? And 
Sometimes we have to do that mm -hmm. because the, simply it's not the, in the nature, as you say, of English to have so many, uh, I mean, you, you lose the track. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have to just simplify it and divide a long sentence into two shorter sentences or use semicolon or basically try to make it more more legible we, we try to stay close to the of course uh, konstantinovich's uh, language as much as possible but not at the price of um, really um, legibility yeah I, I i have to congratulate you i mean <laughs> the very the very fact that has been published as a book in translation is uh, is indeed an accomplishment yeah, yeah. Um, well maybe uh, maybe chris you have one with your question yeah, actually, I, I definitely have do but quite a few questions you. and uh, yeah, i mean the, the big question i think maybe we should get to before the end is a kind of a what is to be done question but i wanted to go back first to the um the title itself and pick up something that we began talking about, which is the uh, uh, the intent on both of your parts, I think, is choosing parochialism rather than, say, provincialism or something like that, is to separate it from, uh, you know, Western post-colonial theory and to say that this is not a, you know, Serbian version of post-colonialism. This is not another project of provincializing Europe. Yeah. Uh, this is not the very familiar sort of metropole <laughs> province, the province writing back and uh, uh, and so could you say a little bit more about how it is different? You know, what is the uh, distinguishing factor for post-colonial theorists? You know, post-colonial theorists have come to this and, and don't really feel quite at home with some of the arguments. Where would a post-colonial theorist come up against something um, hard to, uh, to process or, or digest or, or to make sense of from a type of Western uh, perspective? I think there. I mean, there's several. I mean, I I do not think that this precedes, to my mind, bring, uh, the the birth of postcolonial studies. Um, but uh, less than that, like it's not like the question of dates. It, I don't I don't see this as a study in the postcolonials. And I think that one of the reasons uh, that was another reason that we didn't mention to opt for parochialism as opposed to province is precisely that, that one of the reasons that you know premise of post-colonial uh, studies intervention is like what do you mean by province province in relation to what mm -hmm. um but uh, but that is not really the as i tried to suggest um uh, uh, constitutional intention in so far as uh, in what used to be what the colonial project called provinces um there can be parochialism there um or not uh in other words as i was saying it really this really is an intervention in, into a theory of mind and values um that uh, post-colonial I, I my bet is that some post-colonial um, theories will have um the same issue that some marxists had with this um with with this book, uh, because this is not a book that stands in um, um, like in support of any kind of um, doubling of any theory, whether it's a class or whether it's a, so. So everybody will get a little bit upset um, about different things. But having said that, um, there's also going to be, um, and in fact, one of the things that might not sit very well with the post-colonial theory is um, rather suspicion um, of uh, those who insist on identity, um, which is by no means to say that he was unaware of the you know, colonial project, um, or, but it is to say that he didn't see in kind of recovering um, Kind of the idea of you know continuous traditions, close off traditions, separating traditions, that reestablishing identities, that he didn't see a way out of um, the the terrible um, kind of um, disaster of the colonial project, and that he was um, thinking in different directions that would be more open to closer to, if we are talking about post-colonial, maybe 
closer to Buisan's project of the open boats um, than other projects of like Comlands, uh, like yeah. Cesar. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've, that's exactly right. And I would just like to add one more dimension. So, whereas, um, for example, Deepak Chakrabarti in uh, provincializing Europe works with this uh, really opposition between colonial self and colonized other, and there is that dynamic of the colonial, colonial, colon, colonialized other going back to the colonial self and questioning it and all of that. So there is a certain kind of, let's say, um, a spatial relation there between the, the metropole and the province. One of the key interventions for me in Konstantinovich's work is that parochialism is not only in space, parochialism is primarily in time. Parochialism is in time. Empire needs to colonize time, not only space. And that's happening over and over again. Parochialism is certain kind of historical enclosure. It sees itself outside of history as Hegelian movement of spirit, right? And even that movement ends in a certain kind of state. What is uh, opposed to that kind of uh, uh, temporal imperialism is the mindset that is open, a certain sense of openness and readiness to accept this kind of movement and transformation of time. And this kind of temporalization is what can undermine this kind of uh, parochialism of history. How does it begin as, how does that map out this temporalization as a project of deep provincialization? How does that map on poetry? How does, how does it map out in poetry? What is, what are these poets that he takes as, as the representatives of non-parochial or representatives of outside of parochial state of mind? What do they bring? What, what is their, their characteristic? As, as a literary historian, <laughs> they and pick their fleas. <laughs> well, you know, they're not far from it. I mean, what are the categories? He's talking about experience, right? And yeah, I yeah. find that. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. That's actually quite similar to a question that we have in the QA. Mm -hmm. If you could summarize in one word the opposite of parochialism, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you were already uh, sort of gesturing towards that with the idea of open endedness and temporalization, yes. what would it be in English and in Serbian, perhaps? Is there a um, I suppose to find one term that would mean the opposite would be to reparochialize. So it has to be a kind of a plurality or a. Uh, I think there are many words coming from many philosophers, um, but words like disjunctive synthesis, which sounds like okay. very philosophical, yeah, yeah, right, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. or the relation of the heterogeneous. Yeah or the cosmopolitan alliances. Or um, non-systemic philosophy, uh, yeah, which this book exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all of that, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, all of that can can be. Um, yeah. what is the, uh, the, the Georges Bataille book, which is the, um, uh, the philosophy of the non-philosophical or, or, or something like that. Yeah. And it's really, and it's really for him, I just want to say, and that would be really a shame if the book would be read only as a kind of some sort of either, either be reduced to like philosophy or a kind of a uh, uh, reduced to kind of a localized kind of approach to like Serbian yeah. <laughs> literature. Um, it really is a kind of um, um, it has its philosophical, as they were just talking about, philosophical aspect, literary aspect, and all of that. But in the end, it is a, there is an ethic be, behind it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and there is a kind of an idea of a pra practice, of a kind of a way of behaving and relating to the world and the others, that is. And so I think that that's what people should be looking right. for. And if they don't understand the five page, it doesn't matter, they right, should right. skip. Yeah. Yeah. And then just follow the rhythm of the, the general rhythm of the language and, and the values, and they're going to get that. Um.
I, what I think he, he really responded to when it comes to poets is a certain kind of rigor towards the self, towards themselves. So poetry is does not end in language. That's that's part of his argument. Poetry is not about style. Parochialism likes style, likes form, a perfect uh, poem, right? When you look at this strange company of, of you know people who each in their own way found their way out of the province, I mean, they're characters like no other. This Sredovic, Dushan, he finds, finds him in a lunatic asylum, suspended in a net from the ceiling so that he doesn't fidget, right? He's hanging there, that's the image. Um, he, the, there is this other guy, uh, um, Dr. Um, uh, Perovic, who barely wrote any poetry, but, but he went on crutches from Page to Germany during the First World War, and in the process transformed himself from a staunch nationalist into this kind of universalist and wrote his last book in a camp in German. I mean, it's really strange. And finally, this who dies in a, in a, yeah, he dies in a, his boat was torpedoed. He drowned with uh, like two pennies in his pocket. You should teach a class on those people. Yeah, that'd be great. It doesn't yeah. sound very positive, though. I mean, it sounds quite, you know, I mean, to me, each of them corresponds to characters from Beckett. And you I'm can find them in Beckett, this kind of archetypal you know, figures. Yeah. And I was just want, wanted to add to that precisely about Beckett. There's like, rather wrote a book about Beckett and not about Beckett, but about their friendship. Yeah. Um, they were like, friends for a long time. Um, and and one of the one of the um, things that he so cherished about and admired uh, about Beckett is that that was at least the rarest uh, experience of Beckett that Beckett had almost no sense of self. Um, that it was a really a self-effacing uh, person, and you know that I, he would always repeat that story a little bit after Beckett got a Nobel Prize. He ran away from everybody to Rada's apartment right. <laughs> where nobody could find him but then Belgrade still was too big for, for him and then he just vanished from Rada and then um, and uh, Rad, Rada's wife then and they couldn't locate him for a couple of days and then Beckett comes several days later totally lost and dirty on a bike that he found somewhere ago. there were you I discovered a fabulous place. What is the place? Pancho. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that nobody it's, knew me there. It's like a cross <laughs> again. You're not far away from Dalway, but still kind of it's, nice. It's Palanca. Par excellence. It's like That's at it. the very boundary of. So that, what were you doing there? Don't ask. <laughs> so that this, this really like, you know, and, and that's what he really admired about Beckett. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Beckett, um, my friend or back at a friend is really about that like uh, and, and the time that they spent together but without even talking about one another or each other at all uh, so that's and beautiful then, yeah. and, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry I just want to quote you you yeah. call it the generosity of diversity in your introduction yeah. the same self selfless attitude which is a beautiful way to and, and you know uh, it, throughout his work there is paradox that he's dealing with. And that is how to engage with that kind of dispersal, divestment from the self through writing. And writing is the affirmation of the self, it, it, if anything, in romanticism and so on. And as, as Branka, you mentioned once brilliantly, you know, he writes his last book by giving really the words, the language to Beckett. So in his last book, Beckett, the friend, there are very few things that, that uh, Konstantinovich wrote. Basically the book is the book of Beckett's letters to him. So basically 
he's writing, but by not writing, not writing. but by letting Beckett speak, right? Which is a beautiful final gesture. Letting someone speak who himself doesn't want to speak. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Did you have another question? Um, I think we have uh, one uh, additional question by um, uh, asked by someone named Uf Lushi. Uh, do you think today's Serbia and Balkans can be partially explained or understood better after one reads Konstantina which is uh, book? Um, and since we just have a few moments left in our event, I might even add to that, not just Serbia and the Balkans, but uh, contemporary events. Uh, I have to say that when I was reading the Russia early chapters, Ukraine. Russia yeah. and Ukraine, I was reading- and Sure, three, sure answer, is, answer is yes and yes. <laughs> yes, yes and yes, okay. all right, yes. And I will take yeah. it even further. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so easy to project parochialism on the other mm -hmm. and we do that routinely yes that's but true. look at our moment right now one of the main things that he recognized in parochial spirit is this obsession with the end mm -hmm. and the last chapter is called these the no end, end to the end, no end to the end. <laughs> and we are now in the moment of that obsession with the end the end of the world the anthropocene and all of that and basically what is playing out there is a purely parochial idea. First of all, we have to, what he very clearly states is that parochial, parochialism is a modernist and bourgeois, if you will, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, concept, right, uh, idea. And basically we are witnessing the, the whole civilization bringing itself to the end while not being able to give up on that which brings it to the end. Yeah. Okay. So fretting about the end of the world and still believing in endless growth. It's, it's a paro parochial paradox, you know. For, for, for those who don't know much about the, the, the cultures of the region, um, there is a beautiful sentence in Emma Bovary, which I think is also a novel about uh, um, uh, 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 like philosophy of parochialism, yeah, where, where uh, the narrator says she, that is to say, Emma Bovary, she wanted to die, but she also wanted to live in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The end, yeah. but also a little bit, of, you know, before that, let's go to yeah, Paris. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it can turn. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's the problem of, yeah. of parochialism. Yeah. It obsesses with yeah. the end and it prophesizes its own end, mm -hmm. but it's not ready to accept yeah. it or to yeah. actually move out of the mind. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. also a form of extreme narcissism and yeah. yeah. not being able well, to what? imagine that any, there would be anything. Once this culture is gone, then there will yeah. be no culture. It's, yeah, its entire mode of self-reproduction is based yeah. on imagining that it's about to come to an end. Yeah. And and he's right, it really starts with romanticism. They, they were the first mourners yeah. Yeah. of like yeah. what's lost and and so the history of, of that mourning that's of the culture that's constantly lost um, is still going on today. Yeah. You can see you know that famous yeah. phrase. Uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. It's exactly mm -hmm. what's that. So would I come out as parochial if I call the end of this panel? <laughs> we'll continue in a footnote. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. thank you so much. Thank um, you. Thank you. you wanted to ask more? Or... Uh, no, no. I mean, this is a wonderful discussion. I wish we had yeah. more time yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that we could work through our issues of um, temporalization and historicization and so forth, but uh, all good things must come to an end. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, um, thank you so well, much. Thank you to our audience who has been here. Yes, live. congratulations. Congratulations yeah. on the publication. Remember that about the 30% discount through the University of Michigan, Michigan uh, Press website. Um, I'd like to thank all of our um, folks online who joined us as well, and those who in person, and in person who asked us questions. Um, and um, uh, stay tuned for more further events through the East Central European Center and the Negosha um, Endowment. Thank you to our guests. Thank you, Sandra, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.